Hello and welcome to episode 115 of our SAP on Azure video podcast. Today is October 19th and together with Robert and Goran, we are here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello everyone. Hi. So in the past, we had already a few sessions talking about SAP on Oracle on Azure. And this is certainly a combination that we see quite often when customers move their SAP systems to Azure. Typically, these migrations involve very complex and very big Oracle systems. And, and obviously, for these systems, we have experts. One of these experts for Oracle is Kellyanne Gorman, or Pippi Tech Stocking. She's more or less the expert when it comes to Oracle, and I'm super glad that we have her here on the podcast today. She will later talk about some of her experiences working with SAP and Oracle, and, and with her, actually, we also have Geert. Um, Geert, you um, might remember from previous episodes where we already talked about Azure NetApp files, and that's another area that we will look at in a second. Um, after all, big databases like Oracle also need a very high performance storage underneath. But before we hand over to them, let's take a look at the news from this week. And I want to start, let me share my screen. I want to start with one of the blog posts that I forgot to, to um, mention um, in our last week's episode, and that is um, the CDC connector for Azure Data Factory which is now general available. So I, I had talked about this, um, but I had somehow forgotten to, to bookmark it. And now here you can, can see it. It's, it's linked in the show notes. Um, the, the CDC connector is now um, GA. If you want to learn more about the CDC connector, there is actually an upcoming um, tech brief um, from, from Microsoft that really talks about how to use the CDC connector. So it's, um, on November 16th, and um, we have some really great experts um, um, uh, yeah, presenting the CDC topic. So Ashish Kumar, you, you might um, no, we ha didn't have him on the show yet, actually. But I've um, a lot of discussions, a lot of um, interactions with him. Um, he's, he's definitely an expert when it comes to the whole um, Azure Data Factory integration, and I'm sure he'll provide a really great um, insight into the usage of the CDC connector and also the other colleagues. I'm I'm pretty sure this will be a really um, interesting tech brief on the CDC connector. Another topic um, that I want to highlight really fresh from the press. So um, this was just published um, today by Martin. Martin Pankratz has again um, published uh, another um, topic on um, SAP private link. This time, how to use private link with AKS, with the Azure Kubernetes services on, on Azure. So I think this is also a really, really fantastic story. And actually, I know that Martin was working with a customer on, on this specific project already. So this is really something that is very relevant um, to, to a lot of customers, obviously. And um, as usual in his blog post, he really guides us through all the steps to get this started. He has, again, um, his GitHub repository here somewhere. Where here, here it is um, where, where all the information is there. So if you um, are looking into um, private link, if you're using AKS, then this is definitely something that you should check out and, and give it a try. It's, it's um, really straightforward to um, use private link here with AKS. The next topic that I quickly want to highlight is just a continuation from, from last week. Uh, we already talked about there the announcement from Satya um, in his keynote about this collaborative ERP where, where he showed um, the integration of um, SAP S4HANA cloud in Teams using these um, adaptive card-based loop components. And this is just an, an confirmation basically now uh, from Jan Gilk here on the um, SAP News Center where Jan talks about um, the collaboration, the work that we have done there which, yeah, again, in, ended up in, in the keynote um, from Satya. If you are interested in this, there is this um, early adopter care program. Um, so you can sign up there and um, yeah, get the latest news of, of this integration. So with this, um, we had collected a few more um, topics, um, which are all related to Azure NetApp files. But instead of me um, talking about this, we, we actually have the expert today in our call. So 
um, maybe before we hand over to to you, Reat, um, maybe Kelly and ladies first, obviously, maybe you can introduce yourself quickly and then we'll hand over to Reat and start with the Azure NetApp Files topic. Thank you so much. My name is Kellen Gorman. I am an Oracle SME in the cloud architecture and engineering team. I have been working on Oracle and Azure for almost five years now, but I'm better known in the Oracle space. I'm known as actually DBA Kevlar, not as Pippi Long or tech stalking as we joked about the other day, but I am known as DBA Kevlar. I've been blogging since about 2008. I was an ACE director before I joined Oracle, which is Microsoft or Oracle's version of Microsoft's MVP. And I am an Oak Table member, which is a group of the Oracle scientists in the world there, which is a lot of fun. Um, we, we joke about being uh, Oracle technologists with a drinking problem. So don't ask. Long story. <laughs> long story. Um, but uh, I've been here for almost five years now, and I really enjoy what I'm doing. And it's a data infra play, which is very interesting for folks because they're like, you're not data and AI. You're not infrastructure. No, I'm a little bit of both. So very challenging, and challenging interesting area. And you are really the Oracle expert. I, I have to admit, when I when I started to um, w when we got in contact and I, I searched on the internet or I searched on Twitter, um, it's amazing. And and you you have um, yeah. your own um, web page, obviously, where where you collect a lot of information, where you have lots of books and and, and stuff like that. So I I have to say I'm I'm embarrassed that I never met you before, but it looks like you are really the Oracle expert, there is so. So I'm I'm super happy to to have you know you, you know Holger, they, they do come in pairs though, eh? so Kellen does yes. come in a pair. <laughs> yeah, but not with um, you, Gerd. <laughs> no, not no, with me. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, three years ago, when they they said, "Do you know anybody else with your skills?" They had been interviewing a number of folks, and I just said, "I'm married to him." So they yeah. interviewed Tim, and of course, they loved him. He was my first mentor when I started out in the DBA world. Oh, really? Um, teaching me Oracle. So you will hear Gorman as a service, and it is Tim Gorman and Kellen Gorman here on the CAE team. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> cool. cool. Well, well, again, so you, I'm you, super you happy to have you here. And highly available re uh, redundance. Yeah. <laughs> Unless we both want a vacation at the same time, then it, then yeah, it's a little true. challenging. And yeah, it's a downtime yeah. for many. Kelly, yeah. You have to understand, Goran is our high availability expert. So so if it comes to Windows Server clusters, Goran knows everything. So if you need help in load balancing your vacation, yeah. I'm sure Goran can help you there. <laughs> They're trying to clone us right now. So if you can yes. figure that out, that's be awesome. a good approach. Yeah, be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Cloning, that's the, the, the Gorman, the Gorman replicator, right? So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but with cool. that, I think it's your turn. <laughs> oh, I'm already, uh, if I'm on over, just you know, it'll tell me, yes. uh, ready to go. I, I mean, it's not the first time on the, on the, on the podcast. So thanks for having me again. Um, I do, I do kind of go by a nickname as well because my name is hard to pronounce. Uh, for the non-native Dutch speakers, so I always go also go by the name of Tom, um, and the reason for that is I get my coffees faster at the Starbucks because they can easily spell the name. Right? <laughs> so uh, it helps really uh, getting my uh, my name out. You can actually find me on LinkedIn by the shorthand aka.ms/aka-tom. So aka.ms/aka-tom, and you'll get to my LinkedIn. So a minor gimmick there as well. Anyway, long story short is I'm a product manager or one of the product managers for Azure Net of Files in the uh, Azure Net of Files product group. Um, and I'm responsible for a couple of key areas, but one of them is workload enablement on Azure using Azure Net of Files. And of course, the development of the service to provide you know, improved capabilities to support certain applications uh, better. Uh, one of the areas of interest is, of course, SAP, SAP HANA, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. There's a couple of other workload areas that we'll cover really well as well, like Azure Virtual uh, Desktop, AVS, uh, high-performance computing, a lot of you know those workloads that require high-performance storage. Uh, but not to forget to mention, of course, Oracle, uh, which is the key workload area that we're going to cover as well today. So that's going to be my bridge uh, to uh, to basically back to Kellen uh, later today. Um, but if you uh, if you will, over, I can kind of touch on a few, uh, let's say, news flashes, if you will, that you kind of briefly yes, flashed on the screen already, um, and talk a little bit about them, and then uh, we can transition and move back to uh, to the real topic at hand today. So let me share my screen real quick. I think you should be uh, seeing my screen now. 
Uh, and you already showed this uh, this page a little bit uh, uh, before, but this is a hot of the press document as well that we published actually yesterday, uh, because one of the key challenges that we obviously come across collectively when we talk about large scale databases, including HANA, is uh, performance, but not to forget data protection, right? So how do you manage effectively data protection for you know, a six terabyte, 12 terabyte, and even worse, up you know, soon coming uh, or already available 24 terabyte HANA instances, right? Um, and snapshotting, of course, is a key technology that ANF provides that help you drastically reduce your TCO and T, uh, your RPO and sorry, your RPO and RTO numbers. Uh, but that can only work if you can actually manage to, you know, you manage to orchestrate it well with your application environment. And that's where the you know the Microsoft uh, tool that goes under many different names, but I always call it AZAC Snap or AZAC Snap, uh, which is short for Azure Applica Application Consistent Snapshot Tool. Uh, that tool is already available for quite a while, and it did yeah. support um, you know HANA for uh, quite a while on HANA, HANA large instance. It also already supports uh, Azure Native Files, so HANA on virtual machines with Azure Native Files for quite a while now. Uh, it also supports Oracle, so SAP uh, based uh, Oracle deploy or Oracle based SAP deployments, but also vanilla Oracle deployments, if you will, are also supported by um, by AZAC Snap. But I think one of the key challenges that the customers <coughs> were facing is to get this running and configured in a you know in a high availability setup with HSR. So if you have a which is a very typical deployment, right? So if you have an environment that leverages HSR, you still want to be able to manage your snapshots. Consistently, and this document actually describes that, right? So it, it's available on the uh, on the Azure um, uh, SAP on, on Microsoft Architecture uh, blogosphere. Uh, and if you scroll down, I'm, I'm not going to cover it in detail, but if you scroll down, it will describe a little bit how that you know function, how that you know architecturally would look like. But it will explain exactly what you need to do to set it up to make sure you run your application snapshot uh, consistently across an HSR-based uh, HANA setup. So I think. Uh, a very you know, interesting piece of collateral to quickly get you going in an uh, in a large scale uh, HSR based uh, setup. Um, not only that, I also want to kind of call out quickly that there's also, of course, a recovery guide because backup is really useless if you can't recover uh, because that's what you do it for at the end of the day. It's never a good story to say to someone, you know, don't worry, I have a backup. But if it follows with, I don't know how to recover, it's probably not the best uh, conversation of the day. So this is also some uh, some important document. This is already available for longer. I think we didn't talk about it in the last time I was on your podcast, so I think I really wanted to quickly call this out. So you can mm -hmm. also go through this uh, document to uh, understand how you can quickly, you know, recover from snapshots. So think about it. Uh, you know, HANA databases, 12 terabytes, 6 terabytes, 24 terabytes, doesn't matter. Being able to snapshot them in a couple of, you know, less than a minute uh, or minute and a half, but also be able to recover them in, uh, you know, the snapshot in, 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 in an instant and uh, quickly get your system back up and running in, you know, in, in a shorter period of time is obviously a key to uh, key to recovery, right? So the document describes uh, this in detail as well. Again, I didn't want to go to, uh, you know, cover it in too much detail, but I would really encourage everybody to, to go uh, and read these documents. So, and then last but not least, I think it's important also to note uh, that indeed uh, the uh, Azure Native Files feature application volume group for SP HANA is now generally available, right? So it's been an, a long development cycle uh, with a couple of uh, preview phases before as well, uh, but the feature is now indeed generally available and it allows you to do a couple of things. And But first and foremost, it will speed up and optimize your HANA deployments and Azure Native Files and de-risk your deployments. Meaning you'll get optimized volume layout, you get optimized uh, storage endpoints, you get basically optimized and balanced performance, performance across the underlying storage platform. Uh, and you also be able to leverage proximity placement group automatically to make sure that your volumes get closely uh, deployed with your HANA uh, VMs. Right, so it gives you a lot of that, um, you know, automation. It's basically an atomic one-click type operation uh, to fully deploy a large uh, SAP setup in, in basically in one go. Uh, and what is already has achieved, or some customers have already achieved this, and there's actually one particularly big customer uh, that has used this technology now to deploy a 500 system HANA landscape 
over uh, 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 across over a thousand uh, ANF volumes in a matter of a few days, and normally it would take them literally months to get this deployed, right? So literally speeding up uh, de-risking and optimizing your deployment with uh, application volume group uh, for SP HANA. Um, and uh, I think it's a, a massive achievement and it will be really yeah. beneficial for, for your HANA customers yeah. at large. I mean, that's really a great, a great news because um, part of the speeding up is also not needing a, a pinning of the net apart. And that was really slowing down the whole process. Now everything happens on the at least NetApp side automatically and, and yeah. properly placed. And that's uh, that's automation there to give uh, do a work correctly and also no human intervention. And that's really, uh, I mean, super, super useful. I'm doing on pinning and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, that's that's been uh, let's say suboptimal way of deploying. It was required for latency or for optimized latency mm -hmm. deployments and all the requirements that you need to to meet with uh, with all the HANA KPIs. That's now all being taken care of, fully automated, uh, no <clears throat> basically worry-free deployment. Let let me misuse this opportunity to torture you a bit, Gareth, with additional question. You know, customer has an Oracle as well. Oh, okay, here we have Oracle. And they would love to use the NetApp. So, application volume groups for the Oracle. Look at him add that segue right into the discussion. <laughs> yeah, let's let's go back to that. So that's in right. that's a good bridge. Actually, that's a good handover moment also for me because, I mean, let's say Hana databases are notoriously bad already from a capacity and performance standpoint. But if you look at Oracle deployments and then particularly the ones that Kellen is dealing with, and she's going to talk a lot about it now, yes. is are monstrous, right? I mean, we're talking about multiple tens of terabytes, uh, mm -hmm. you know, massive amounts of throughputs needed and all that, which is obviously, let's say, even you know, tenfolds the challenges that we would have with HANA. Uh, you see that in, in Oracle, right? So uh, and we are working very closely together with Kellen uh, on on future enhancements for AVG, right? So if you look at AVG for SAP HANA, it's it's called Application Volume Group for SAP HANA for a reason because obviously it's a framework for more. Um, so we are looking at uh, you, know, in, you know developing and segueing into uh, supporting additional applications, and that is indeed uh, covering a, a bunch of uh, applications like Oracle. Uh, but in order to let's say, do that proper, then obviously we need to understand what an actual Oracle, let's say significantly sized Oracle environment looks like in order to be able to, you know, deploy volumes in the right sizes and in the right optimal way, uh, similar to HANA, but in a better way, more suited to Oracle. So I think that's kind of a good bridge to, to the topic uh, that you guys are going to talk about, Kellen. I think if you're if you're talking about you know oracle monstrous oracle what does it mean how do you identify that and what is the transition path to uh, to an azure you know uh, to an azure uh, destination if you will uh, and holger Absolutely. feel free to oh, ask perfect. questions of course but this is uh, this is really uh, the the time for you Kalen. yeah workload is everything especially with oracle um i was incredibly impressed when i saw avgs i was in intrigued uh, as the segue in different conversations that I had with ANF folks of would this work for Oracle? I said, absolutely, it's what I need. Many times I, I joke about being at Oracle with Azure that I am the trust, I am the foster child with a trust fund. Everybody may want the money, they may not want to take on the challenges of doing Oracle on Azure. So when NetApp says, I'm going to help you, when the ANF folks say, I'm willing to help you accomplish this, I'm very appreciative of that. And AVG does have potential for Oracle workloads, and we're hoping to see that go forward. We are starting to do some tests right now. And of course, with me, that means I want to see the numbers. So we're doing slob testing right now. where We want to see silly little Oracle yeah. benchmark, if you're not familiar with that. I've got to see those numbers that say you can handle these workloads. Mm -hmm. But it also gets into the workloads. How do you identify what those are? And that's where I'm going to end up sharing my screen here. And what I've done is I have real AWR reports. And if you're not familiar with those, that's the automatic workload repository that I'm sharing on my screen now. Um, these have been completely scrubbed of customer data 
So uh, there's no SQL in here. You couldn't see the full SQL. I took it completely out of the HTML report. But um, for Oracle, this is something that we pretty much live for. Um, the automatic workload repository is always on. It has a default of eight days. Most, most DBAs pump that up to about 30 to 60 days retention. After that, they're going to need my old product from Oracle called the AWR Warehouse. You would offload that data. But to keep 30 to 60 days inside a production system is not going to hurt it at all. It's always on. It uses its own memory. It reads one way. It writes the other. I mean, it's an incredibly efficient system. Um, many Oak Table members, those Oracle scientists that you know we were talking about, they're the ones who wrote this. I mean, it's incredibly amazing what they've done with this. And it was the descendant of what was called the stats pack before. So for those customers that for some reason wouldn't have enterprise edition or didn't pay for the diagnostic and tuning pack that's required to get this data, they can use stats pack. We do that as well. But this is the HTML report that you're seeing from here. For an Exadata environment, it could be up to 30 pages. For a standard Oracle rack environment, it could be down as low as 15 pages. But it's a big report, so knowing what you want to look at, knowing what you're looking for, I think is crucial for anyone to make intelligent decisions and not to get overwhelmed by that data. Mm -hmm. There are some averages and aggregates in here. So knowing where those are, how to assess this data, I think is helpful. So I have three examples here, scrubbed reports. We're going to start with this one that is a four node rack environment. And of course, you're seeing this pretty quick, you know, what we're dealing with. Rack, is it, um, if you're not familiar with pluggable databases, that is the multi-tenant solution for Oracle. Oracle had high hopes for this. They thought that customers would start breaking up their schemas and making it easier to move these databases to the cloud. They didn't. They just took the whole thing and dumped it into a pluggable database. So uh, CDB isn't as big a deal, you know, and having pluggables, PDBs, as it used to be. <laughs> we don't care if it is or not. It's still pretty much the whole shebang they threw into a database. And uh, understanding the elapsed time on here and what you're looking at. So we've got the four different instances. And notice what we have in elapsed time. This is a one-week report when you're seeing 10,000 minutes. Notice how much DB time there is. This is a pretty busy database. If you're doing 10,000 for 10,000, it's an average busy. When we're looking at 65,000 minutes in a 10,000 minute elapsed time, this is an incredibly busy database. Um, I know that I'm looking at a whale in the pond, and that's one of the first things you're going to look at. Am I dealing with, as we call the whale in the pond, a small environment for SAP running Oracle? I'm going to show you why Oracle runs so hard when it's running SAP. We'll discuss that. It's in the init parameters. But we'll start out just knowing that when we see DB time like this, this is each one of these databases. And because Rack is not supported on any cloud other than Oracle, Oracle has an iron fist on Rack and is not going to allow you to create that Rack, what we call instance resiliency and scalability outside of Oracle Cloud. We do, we actually do vertical scaling. And uh, we're able to use something called Data Guard, which is similar to always on availability groups. For those of you that are used to like Azure SQL and that, it's Mary's much better, much more, it's, it's much more compatible with Azure um, HA. So I always recommend, you know, don't be kind of offended when somebody says, well, I have to have Rack. Rack is a solution. It's not the solution. Don't, so don't be concerned when you see, oh my gosh, they're using Rack. This one is load balanced across all the nodes. But again, I want to know about that workload. I want to know what it's going to require. We know 85% of our customers are over provisioned. And it's natural mm -hmm. to have this happen because when we start thinking about how Oracle and how any environment is done for capacity planning on prem, you have to make sure that you size out that hardware to last you three to five years. You got to make sure that no matter what modules, no matter what apps, no matter what code is implemented in that system, that that hardware can handle it. So these are padded. They are over provisioned to a point that will really surprise you when you do sizing assessments. And hopefully that kind of makes sense as, as mm -hmm. we're talking through this. No, it makes a lot of sense. And, and just to, to highlight in this specific case, so this is the Oracle database that is running underneath an SAP system, basically, or I mean, yes. the, the SAP system is using here its Oracle days. We have four nodes um, for the specific Oracle system. And as you said, <laughs> we can see there's a lot of uh, things happening there. Yeah. Yes. 
And this is 19C, and 19C is on its way of running a record of more patches than any other Oracle version in history. Uh, <laughs> there are some bugs out there. Oracle is kind of on a skeleton crew for their releases. Uh, we're not too happy with them. We hope the person who has put in all the CPU usage bugs got a really nice raise, since that means more Oracle licensing for Oracle that you have to pay for. It. So be <laughs> really aware of when you see a 19C environment. If they're not patched the newest version, they may likely have 11 to 15 CPU bugs that are actually um, compounding how much CPU they need versus the workload. Very important to be aware. Customers that are saying, hey, I'm on 12C and I'm thinking of upgrading 19C, be aware that there are bugs in there that, you know, the 12C workload may take one amount of, you know, number of CPUs. And then when you upgrade it to 19C, it can go up to triple. So this mm -hmm. is this is kind of a concern to us and something we're always aware of. Yeah. And I would just add, in the context of migration of SAP and Oracle to Azure, it is a must to use this Oracle report because those early watch report from SAP do, does not give you those level of detailed Detail information inside. on the database itself, where you yep. need to look also CPU and storage and then then so to in order to properly size. Yeah. The other number to figure out what you're dealing with is this CPU number. When you're seeing numbers and you know. 500,000 into the millions here on seconds. This is a lot of CPU um, power. This is a database that's busy on CPU too. Um, this, this tells you a little bit about what you're dealing with. You know, even when we sum this up here, this is seconds of CPU use. Uh, you know, you look at it versus the actual SQL time. Yeah, SQL is very busy on this, the actual lapse time for execution. Mm -hmm. But this DB CPU is an, an ex it, an incredibly important value that we use in our calculations when we're doing a sizing assessment. Mm. The next one that we start spending time in is our top time events. I want to know this is coming from an exadata. I know immediately, and I also know that this is a real inefficient use of an exadata. Cell single block physical read. That means that with an exadata, you've got your database nodes and you've got your cell nodes. And what you want it to do is go take this table scan. Go get all the data and bring it back. What this tells me is that this has gone over, took a whole bunch of data, put it off to the, the cell nodes, scanned a whole bunch and brought back a single block. Not very efficient. And this tells me it may run more efficiently off of Exadata. This is a lot of IO for very little value. This is important as I'm starting to look into what I'm doing. And usually when we look at our database time, I'm looking at anything that's over 10%. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this. You'll also notice that even though the backup is 59% of the DB time, it's pushed down. That's because backups are background processing and it may not allocate the same kind of percentage rate that you would think of. This is a big deal too. Um, one of the values when we start talking about it, ANF, this type of storage has the, um, you know, the AZ snap that we can That's take true. advantage of. And we would be able to take our man out of the scenario. For us, our man, you know, I like to say the 90s called, they'd like their backup tool back. It is old, it is streaming technology, and it is a considerable IO consumption. We're talking anywhere from 20 to 40% on top of a large database like this. Something that may have taken on-prem for, you know, eight hours may take 20 hours in the cloud. So if you can remove this with a storage solution, such as, you know, a &F, where you can do AZ snaps and do point-in-time recoveries from that, and get this out of there, think about how much IO you're returning back to the user. This is a really big deal. So these are kind of the things that I'm looking for. SQL net break, reset client. This is something that tells me that I'm looking at network issues that I wanna make sure, and we were talking about those, the AVGs, why those were so important, that they include the proximity placement groups. When we're building out these multi-tier systems, because the application and the database tier need to be very close together, I'm seeing something like this. I wanna make sure that Azure knows these are a data ecosystem, that they all must be very closely connected. That's another feature that's very important to me because manually we put in those proximity placement groups to connect those and again, let Azure know. So these are kind of the things that I'm looking for. And of course, anytime I see anything GES or GC weights, that tells me that mm, Rack may not be benefiting as me as much as I think it is. All of this making sense as we go through this? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything, you know, under 10, I'm not paying as much attention to, but it's still extremely important to me as I start to see, you know, am I getting seeing IO issues, you know, again, 
cell list blocks, physical read. Again, this isn't if this isn't effective use of my O. Am I doing more work in temp than I am using in the process global area because I can't allocate what I need in memory? These are all things that can come back to haunt us. So I'm very aware of that. I'm going to look at my top SQL. And for here, the SQL statements may look like they're connected when we get past all the GIS and all this other stuff that's in here, our details. Again, this can be very overwhelming if you're not aware of these. But top SQL by lapse time, if we're not tuning for time, we're wasting time, I like to say. So it's really important to look into these and see what is time being spent on. Did the actual SQL statements, they should all have executions in them. Make sure that you, you actually collected all the data. You're not having missing data from this. And see what is the low hanging fruit. Are we spending a lot of time on something that doesn't make any sense? Is it background processes? Is it management jobs like stats collection that may need to be made more efficient once it's going to Azure? Are we not using ASM, which is the, um, uh, the actual automatic storage management for Oracle, but at the same time, we're still doing Space Advisor to get information ASM. There's a lot of times things that people don't realize that they've still got in place that has no reason for it and is using considerable I.O. I.O. is king here, so always remember that. And the nice thing about the AWR is it breaks stuff up by going, here's your top by memory, here's your top by I.O., and you can look at all of this data and make sense of it. The other area that most people don't realize is included in the system is specific exadata um, points. Uh, a lot of times we stop at the end of the report and the truth is, and I'm going to scroll up just a little bit here because that is the challenge of working with these, is that this will tell us just about everything we need to know about this exadata and we're past it right here. Um, for the Exadata configuration, it's going to tell us what kind of Exadata we're on. Um, the X2 or the X9 two Ls are the brand new one. So if you're seeing, you probably won't see too many X8s, people coming off of those, but the sixes and the sevens are at end of life. They're leaving them. If you see something saying Sunfire, Sparkfire, you're looking at very old Exadatas. Um, they pretty much are one for one. You're not going to see much of a performance benefit. Uh, you know, from those exadatas versus being in Azure, uh, it's not surprising that they'll actually perform better on our Ice Lake chips. Don't worry about them. But these ones tell you right here, these are the most common ones that I see customers coming over for. They will tell you what is the CPU count, what is the memory on these, and how many cell nodes. These are those secondary servers that are just doing work. They're workhorses. They're just doing all the work behind the scenes. What is interesting about these is that they will tell you the actual disk, the storage that's being used on there. It'll tell you the ASM disk, disk groups, what the size is and how much used. It, it For newer versions, it'll only tell you for the database that you're actually taking the assessment for. But for most of these older ones, it'll tell you all of the storage that's on there. And it'll tell you all the IO for all the databases, including the usage of the cell nodes. Now, I don't break this down by cell nodes because data, the databases spread across and do load balancing across the cell nodes. So that's not as interesting to me. But to be able to look in here and see what I'm dealing with for redo log writes, knowing that I'm doing seven gigs in redo log. I mean, that is, you know, mm -hmm. where I'm actually doing all those changes. I want to know that. How much am I doing per second for my actual smart scans? Flash caches. You know, people say, well, how am I going to address this when I'm leaving this? Inside SAP, I'm going to be more, I'm going to have more boundaries around me on what I can do and what is certified to run on Azure. But be aware that as we move forward and as we start to address some of these problems, we already know that we can use the ephemeral disk on many of our VMs and allocate flash cache there. For redo logs, we can separate out those redo logs and allow them to not compete with the actual data files for high reads. We know that we can deal with our I.O. that we're dealing with here. Um, when we start looking at how many I.O. writes in that, go down to the database section and notice, not from I.O. summary, but from the IO requests and down to the megs per second, it will break it up by database after you get past all the cell node data. And apologies as I scan through this. And we will see what is the performance for megs per second, a little farther. <laughs> like I said, a lot of data. Here's our IO requests. And as you can see, I did a mass replace on base. I paid for it too. 
<laughs> but right here, top databases by IO throughput. Now, what's interesting here is this with the asterisk is the database that this is the report for. Be aware that that asterisk will tell you which one. On average, it's doing 2,700. And 12 megs per second. I can see that immediately. I know what my target is. I have that. I also know it's not the whale in the pond. The SAP2 is mm -hmm. 4,282. I already know this. I already identify this. I commonly expect that when I bring this off, I'm going to have offloading. I'm going to have hybrid columnar compression, which we can also see here if they're using that or if they're using, you know, advanced compression from Oracle. What is that IO explosion, as we call it, when we take it off the storage? Because there is compression that is in ANF. We know that we're going to have maybe a about a 20 percent increase on that IO. So if I'm sitting here going, I'm doing about 2712, I'm going to expect this workload with the loss of storage indexes and everything else, I'm, I know I'm dealing with about 4,000 megs per second right there. I can figure that out just by looking at the megs per second here and figuring out what I'm going to lose, that I'm going to add about another 1,300 megs per second on this. I'm going to have a little bit of additional headroom for the loss of compression and a little bit of headroom that I'm going to deal with for the loss of storage indexes and storage indexes are indexes that are created in memory that have they're not exactly indexes they've also got like profiles and uh, hints and bind variables all built in to try and kind of give it a little bit better performance but that is all built into this so that's kind of how I use this report and giving me a target ratio of do my numbers when I do a sizing assessment match this because where we get those sizing numbers and I'll do a find on page this time because we're not going to look for this if we look up function it'll bring us right to this this is where we grab our numbers for our data. So if you look the actual megabytes per second in IO data, we're grabbing it from here. So I can see my totals for our megs per second is 292.69. Now keep in mind that I'm looking at all of that time and I have to calculate this back into the system. I need to do this for every one of these. So we add each one of these together and it does all the calculations behind the scene. So the numbers that I end up in my sizing assessment should come close to about 4,000. I'm going to use that bottom number to say that's my target I expect that I'm going to fall to. And I'm going to usually times this by four in my assessment worksheet that we use. And I'll put links to the worksheet when we're done here too. So people have that. We can also look at this by the file type. And this is really helpful when we start to see backups. Now the backup data I'm not seeing in here, I can see the log file data. Usually we see this for back backup as well. And I'm not sure why it's not included in here. It usually is. And you can find out just how much backup is included in here, you know, the total. Because when we're looking at this total, we expect backup as well as the archive log um, coming, you know, as part of this and having to be, you know, assessed. Um, realize how much is that backup going to be part of this and impact my ability if I can take that out of the I.O. That's going to give me a little bit of a benefit there. But this is kind of how we do this, that I can actually look at this report and come up with the assessment and know exactly what I'm working with. Um, we can go in here deeper if, if there's interest in it of going into what we're looking at on, you know, physical redo logs, um, latch latency, all of that fun stuff as well. That's really fascinating, oh. actually, what insights you, you can get there on the Oracle side. I mean, obviously, on, on the SAP side, we have the early watch reports, which give you an overview of the SAP system. But here, you can really, really drill, drill down in the nifty gritties of, of your or Oracle system. So I think that is yeah. extremely helpful. Well, I was realizing that some of the SAP specialists was were referring to Oracle to do a deep analysis and mm -hmm. they were using those watcher reports, the, mm -hmm. the folks from Oracle, along with the AWR and putting them together to come up with a report. And it it bothered me a little bit that we were having customers pay a lot of money each year to assess their system as part of a service from Oracle, when in fact, this is all it is. 
if you understand those watcher reports, and again, I don't, that's something I want to learn, and you can learn this AWR, you would be able to do that for these customers. These AWRs are a gift from heaven. And keep in mind that along with the AWRs, when you get into 12C and beyond, and we didn't talk about, we will talk about these initialization parameters. There is commonly an ADDM report that will even give you hints about what needs to be addressed. And it's gonna be in one of these. I know I've got an ADDM as part of this. So I can mm -hmm. show it and you'll know it because it's still in the old text output. See if we can find one real quick. I'm sure I have one. So these reports Question. are available since Oracle 12. There it is. Is it? No, actually 11.203 is when they were okay. uh, first released and then 11.204 they came into full um, um, full capabilities, and of course, every release there's been new. The mm -hmm. repository keeps getting bigger and bigger with each of them. This is an ADDM report, and you'll notice it by the actual, I think it's like Courier, the old text on this. It's a black and white, white text report. But notice that it'll start breakdown by SQL statement and even tell you what SQL needs to be fixed, which is very beneficial. So it will tell you, is there an application weights? Is there a database? What do you need to do? Do you need to, you know, fix an index? All of that is included as part of this. Oh, cool. Yeah. So it highlights the issue and tells you what needs to be fixed. Exactly. Very much worth the time and effort that's included in here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about the init. Um, we had one right here, I believe. Let's go down. Here we go. So what's interesting about SAP with Oracle is all of these lovely underscore parameters, which are most of them. Um, underscore parameters should only be okayed by Oracle. Um, there is a mix of these that are SAP um, required, and then usually customers have different fixed controls in that that have been put in. Those are for bugs in that. Um, what's interesting is that um, these, like these GC ones here, this changes how Oracle can use its global cache, which is the memory used between the different nodes, how it communicates. And those nodes, as they're communicating, they have to let each other know what you're doing. I'm updating this block. Do you need this block? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I need to update this block. All of that needs to be communicated, and it's changing how it communicates between them. GC mm -hmm. read mostly locking, false. Well, this kind of is concerning. This means that Oracle has to work harder, not more efficient in the way that it, you know, naturally would work. Cursor obsolete threshold. They've changed the threshold for when cursors become obsolete. ASM write cancel. They've actually got a, a size when they, they um, cancel the write threshold on it. All of these you can start looking at and understanding. KKS has to do with mutex lashes in, in memory. All of these are extremely important. So are these. These are memory latches as well. The LMs, LM sync timeout, LM tickets, all of this has to do with memory sizing. Optimizer, use stats on conventional DML. Optimizer, gather stats on conventional DML. False on both of those. That means that on DML, it doesn't have the most up-to-date information on the statistics for any object. These all impact the way that Oracle will run, and it means that Oracle won't run as efficient as it might if it had the traditional default parameters. And this is evident in every single SAP environment. I know SAP environments immediately by the amount of these. We commonly see in an ERP, you know, EDS system, it, there would be five. But like right here, these are all bugs that they put fixes in for, all these fixed controls. Those are all mm -hmm. bugs. So this is extremely concerning for a DBA that's doing an assessment on a system and wants to know, now I expect a database to perform one way to do something. You know, through the permutations, it's going to automatically do a group hash by at this point, and you can't count on anything because it's saying, optimizer, use these bind peaking. Know what the bind variables are before you actually decide on a plan, false. How do I know what this is going to do before it actually does it? Does it? Most of the time, Oracle's hands are tied behind its back. Mm -hmm. so, so let me actually ask you two questions then on this. So first of all, these recommendations for these underscore parameters, are they then coming from SAP? And, and, and you're saying, well, they, they 
don't make sense all the time. If, if you really want to tune them, then maybe you, you should change them or you should adjust them accordingly. No. Um, you have to verify, you should justify mm -hmm. and verify mm -hmm. every single one of these and make sure that they're correct for the release of SAP with uh, Oracle. Yes. Mm -hmm. Always, because these are impacting the way this database runs, and it could, if they're ones that aren't supposed to be there, that means that that database is running even harder than it needs to. Yeah. Always verify them. The other thing is, is that you could have ones in here that are from earlier releases. And remember, yep. the way that Oracle prints these out, it doesn't say these are the SAP ones, these are the ones you added. It just lists them all out, so they can be yep. intermixed. And you need to make sure of that, absolutely. Uh, upgrades are not going to catch all of these, so no. always check them out. You know, we're looking, here's more mutex ones, wait time, mutex wait scheme. This means it's holding on to memory a lot longer than it needs to. These are all important to me, and some of these I just have to look up. That's the mm -hmm. only way I know. There are thousands and thousands of these that are available, and you need to just look them up and find out. You may not be able to tell by the name. Um, I mean, I find this a bit... With Oracle, challenging <laughs> so many parameters. Although the DB admin are uh, argumenting, but you you can tune it really fine, you know, <laughs> like excellently tune, which you can't yeah. do. I don't know with. SQL. And 10G, 10G, we used you know parameter level tuning all the time, but at 11G we were told you know hey this is impacting at the database level. Try to do it at the SQL level. Try to do it at you know the the object level. Don't be doing it at the full database level. And people pulled back. Then in 12C and 19C you started having database level parameters that were implemented again. So it's kind of okay. it depends now. But okay. underscore parameters are different than standard parameters. Okay. So, you know, we started talking about old ones like, I don't know, optimizer index cost adjustment. Um, that was an old 9i10g of how to change the percentage kind of value to an index when it was used in a query. When we got into the, these that are underscore parameters, these should only be authorized by Oracle. And you should okay. always verify that they're there first. These are all very impactful as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Use a, use single log writer. doesn't matter how many log writers you add. It's only going to use a single one. So you could think you're tuning and you're not getting any benefit. Okay. I think that this is really, so, so when I, um, when I then, for example, migrate from an Oracle on-premises system to Oracle on Azure, I guess I, I could assume, well, I'm using 19 Oracle 19C or whatever on, on premise, so I'll use just the same parameters on, on, on Azure. I guess um, that's not a good idea that, that I should really also go in there and do some Azure specific um, Oracle tuning, even though it's yes. the same version, the same setup and everything. And you also need to look at this value right here. I don't know how many times I've come and it said compatible and says 12.2.0. Um, that's not a 19C okay. database, that's a 12C database. Mm -hmm. So they can't move to the 19C optimizer because they may have some code that they just couldn't figure out the performance challenge of. So they just left it at 12C even though it's a 19C system. Okay. So, so to your point, uh, Olga, I think, <clears throat> I mean, some of the experience that we've had in the past has shown that indeed if you try to just pick up your Exa database database and lift it to Azure as is that you probably be having a hard time, you know, managing get, getting the performance that yeah. you need. Uh, I think Kellen, we we did we've done an assessment about two years ago for a Dutch bank that uh, allegedly required up to eight gigabytes per second of throughput if untuned. Um, now tuning after tuning, it turned out that the, you know the throughput was actually less than half of it that they needed, right? So yes. also there, you know, you get you get a lot more favorable, uh, let's say, consumption of your of your resources in Azure if you do it right, and that allows you to scale uh, better, right? So th that that job is important. Um, I think what this is also showing is that obviously compared to HANA, your database sizes are typically a lot larger. Uh, they don't typically fit in memory like a HANA database would fit into memory entirely. So your your workload is typically more IO storage IO heavy, right? Mm -hmm. So it's more dependent on the storage IO. So yeah. you, you, tuning for storage performance that you can get in Azure is obviously important because that will get you the, be the best uh, outcome. 
Um, and nice. that's kind of the part of the exercise that the Kevin is going through from, you know, from an assessment sizing perspective, et cetera. And that's what we are, let's say, aiming towards with, with ANF to provide the right layout yeah. for your mm -hmm. volume deployments such that you can get the best out of the infrastructure. So you put the best infrastructure in place to run your Oracle database the best. That's kind of uh, what this really this exercise is all about at the end of the day. Again, as we were talking about this one, the cell single block physical read, when we take that workload off, it's no longer going to offload that workload to those cell nodes. It won't have those cell nodes anymore. It actually has to process it normally. So it's not going to take those objects, move them over to the cell node, run the workload, then bring back one block. It's not going to do that anymore. Um, this is a lot of I.O. for no real positive performance gain. And if you notice, every one of these nodes are showing that is the number one problem. This is a workload that we often find that Oracle will throw an exadata at it because they don't know what else to do with it. They're like, I don't know, it's it's a big workload. Just sell them an exadata. That's what <laughs> happens here. And we see that often. And I think if we, I mean, this is now I'm on the third one. I'm not even on the first one that we were seeing this. That was on the third one that we were seeing that. So, I mean, I think if we go down into each one of these, because this was when we started out with that we saw that sell single block rate, sell single, you know. Let's see, is this one the same? This is the next question. Do we see this here too? It's very, very common. And as soon as I see that, I know I just won. This is the backup. This is sell single block physical rate. That is not the best use of an exadata. What you want to do is that you need somebody to get a whole bunch of data back. And so they offload this workload to a cell node. It massages it all, does the group hash by the sort, and it brings all of it back and says, ta-da. That's not it. That's a single block. And that's an inefficient use of an exadata. And that's for all three of those workloads we just looked at. They're from three different customers. I can tell you that too. So, so I think um, if you are running an Oracle system, the next thing that you should do after watching um, this episode is take a look at the report and look for the single block. What is it called? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, cell, cell single sing block physical read. Yeah, we want to see. Cell single block physical read. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, when you see cell smart table scan, which is the fourth one down there, mm -hmm. that's a good use of an exadata. Okay. We like those. We say, oh, you scanned this table and brought all the data back the way that it needed to be presented. Um, for a lot of our customers, when they're starting to do a lot, and this is what I used to do for, for Ancatech, is they would sell exadatas, and then I would be in there, and they would ask me, you know, I want to get like three to five times better, you know, performance out of that exadata. The workload has to be designed to take advantage of those exadata engineered features. If it's not, it's a give or take. You might get a little bit performance mm -hmm. just from the hardware benefits, because remember, it's pretty massive hardware. But um, if you're not, you're going to see the same performance problems even years later. Um, I thought it was really interesting when the Exadata that I was in charge of back in 2010, I got the reports years and years later from 2007 before they went to an Exadata from another partner. And uh, it was the same sequel that came back to haunt them years later. It's you can't hardware your way or engineer system your way out of a software problem. It will come back to haunt you. Yeah. It's always outsourcing my software problem to hardware. Yep. To hardware. Yeah. So keep that in mind. I mean, for our Exadata, most of our customers, because we follow this framework over and over again, they're getting better performance in Azure than they did on their Exadata because we assess and understand that workload. Mm -hmm. And then we build out the solution that will support that. Um, you know, if they're doing, they've got a lot of log weights, then we're going to address that log latency. If we see a lot of, you know, uh, physical reads, we're going to give them the IO that they need underneath that storage for their data files to give them that best performance there. As uh, Geert was talking about, I mean, we see customers all the time that are saying, you can't handle my workload. I'm doing 30,000 megs per second. And then I go through their workload and I say, you're really doing 15,000 megs per second. This is why. This is what's really going on. And they'll come back and go, she's right. 
she's right because you're providing them data from these AWRs. And for those folks that are looking to get a hold of these AWRs, you're also asking the DBA for a report that's very different than the way they may naturally use this. You're not asking for a one hour report. You're not asking for a report from a time just high performance. You really want to assess the workload and to assess the workload, you need a one week report. You want to see everything going on in that database. You can feed in and create those peaks and everything through the assessment links that we'll provide um, afterwards. But you keep that in mind. We want a one week single report. Don't get a whole mm -hmm. bunch of little reports. And you can look at that, assess that workload and really understand what's going on in the system each week. Oh, well, yeah. So that's the, 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 the main that's call to action. Do this, yeah. take a look at this. Thank and you. Uh, I think provide that link for it. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Does it make sense? Or is it possible? Typically, I mean, they would run some on at least in the SAP context, some monthly or quarterly bad jobs, you know, uh, which would push also the database. Uh, does it make sense also to run this report for a month? I, I don't know if it's possible or even longer in order to uh, identify those peak because typically they are mm -hmm. redundant, you know, and maybe even try to scale it better or tune it better for that purpose. Oh, we found that one week was the sweet spot. When we did longer, the averages ended up getting lower and lower. We found that one week was a good mm -hmm. window. If customers have month end reports, uh, get that week during that month end. You know, okay. try to get it then. Yeah, um, we do a lot of this for e business suite and other, you know monthly month end quarter end and we found that was the the thing is that if we got one week smallest would be three to five days but again i want to make sure i have that weekend processing a lot of times we forget what happens when we're not there what's outside our purview yeah. so to get the weekend process and they're like oh i didn't even think about that running all weekend you know so to get the weekend get the nighttime processing get those backups all of that that people don't yeah. think about how much is required to run those. Okay, cool. Great. Uh, again, thank you so much. I, I have to admit, I've never taken such a closer look at, at these reports. I, I know that the reports on the SAP side, but on the Oracle side, uh, I, I'm not so familiar. So, so thank you very much for, for going through this very, very long details and, and uh, report and, and highlighting a few sections. I think there was really a great um, start to to just learn how to um, identify issues with your Oracle system and then obviously improve it. Absolutely. Cool. Well, with this, um, I think we can close the, the the session for today. I'm again, I'm, I'm I was really happy to have you here. Um, let's see, maybe we can have a follow up on, on some other cool things that you're encountering when working with SAP on Oracle. I'm sure there are lots of other things, but for now, Thank you so much, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Ulgur and uh, Goran. Thanks, Kellen. Love to come Thank back you. at some point in time when ready. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.